Hello everyone. Today Without we have our first speaker uh, from presentations on COVID-19. His name is Dr. Sabhat. Our first speaker from Brown University. Uh, Brown University. His name is Dr. Sabhat. He's an A medical professor. A medical center. Brown University. He's a cardiologist at Providence um, VA Medical Center and Lifespan. Uh, Can you, can you share your screen and share it, please? My talk is on uh, an overview of COVID-19 and how it affects the clinical trial system. Uh, I'll start with a brief background. I'll talk about the pathophysiology, and then I'll talk about how COVID-19 and cardiovascular system interact. And then I will talk briefly about prevention and treatment. Um, so COVID-19 is caused by a coronavirus. The coronavirus are similar strand, positive sense RNA viruses. They are called corona because of the crown-like projections that you see on the screen here. Uh, that's the S protein, which is uh, important for the viral attachment to cells. There are seven known strains of coronavirus family. Four of them cause limited respiratory disease. Uh, three of them cause ac acute respiratory distress syndrome, and you know them, SARS, MERS, and now the uh, COVID-19. They live in animals, and then some, sometimes they jump into humans, and sometimes they are successful, like the current scenario. It's been growing very rapidly. Only two days ago, it was uh, 1.4 million people worldwide. Uh, 400,000 people in the U.S., 52 cases in Ethiopia, and 7,000 in Africa. But the number changes every day. Uh, it is very fatal. Um, the fatality has varied between around 2% to up to 12 to 14, 15% in Italy. Uh, it depends on the population, uh, the testing that's being done. Um, the amount of care that's available. Uh, but what we know is, unlike cold viruses or flu virus, it has a significant fatality. Um, so 3 4% fatality on average, 5%, and 1 million people. Why is it affecting the world so much? Uh, the mystery lies, in, uh, the, the answer lies in geometric growth. Uh, because of the way it transmits, each sick person can transmit the disease to two or three other people. By contrast, in influenza, one person only transmits to 1.3. So this allows the virus to grow rapidly, geometry grows, and that's the fear. If it's allowed to spread and affect millions, it could have a catastrophic impact uh, on human lives and, and the economy as well. Um, for instance, in the U.S., in 2017, there were 45 million cases, flu cases, and there were 61,000 cases. That is 0.1% mortality. If this disease is allowed to spread and infected 45 million people in the U.S., 1.4 million people will die. And you can imagine worldwide, if hundreds of millions are infected, tens of millions could die. That's why there is the emphasis on preventing the spread, or as they call it, flatten the curve. Uh, so that the, the burden is not over the health care's carrying capacity, and it, all, it also allows for uh, uh, treatments and vaccines to be developed in the meantime. So the virus, it has these S spikes, the corona, that interacts with S2 in, in uh, receptor. This is angiotensin converting enzyme to receptor, which then interacts with another receptor which allows the virus entry into the cell. It's an RNA virus. It takes over the cell's machinery, 
and reflex uh, starts replicating its own proteins, and then it goes uh, goes to the next cell. Now the main symptoms are fever, greater than ninety five percent of the cases, cough, again greater than seventy five percent of the cases, fatigue, forty to seventy percent of the cases. Here this is uh, the percentage of the cases you see on the right hand, and uh, it's the range that has been reported in different studies. You can have sputum production, you can have myalgia, sometimes sore throat, and nasal symptoms rarely. So mostly it is lower respiratory tract symptoms. Diarrhea is also rare, 5-10%. Um, so these are the main symptoms. So, and uh, on testing, on imaging, there could be chest X-ray findings, but up to 40% may not have it. CT scan is more sensitive. You can see patchy opacity throughout. Troponins could be elevated. AST, ALT, liver enzymes will, level, will be elevated. Lymphocytopenia is something to watch for. It's easily available test and uh, low lymphocyte count can be a sign of poor prognosis. LDH level being high also can be a sign of severity. So these are some of the, the, the things we'll see on a lab test. So here is, for instance, um, an X-ray from a 75-year-old male in Italy, and the cuts can be below it, which shows this uh, bilateral fluffy infiltrates. Uh, on the right hand, we see another 61-year-old male from China. You see the bilateral opacities, and after a couple of days, lower down, you see the opacities have gotten worse, they are coalesced, and there is effusion as well. So rapidly progressive. Um, so about the disease course, uh, you might have the infection on day five days before or seven days before onset of symptoms. And then if you say you have onset of symptoms on day zero, usually most people who get worse end up getting admitted around day seven to ten. And shortness of breath also starts between day five and between day, day, day five and day ten. Now, the same time around day seven to twelve is a significant time where people start to get worse significantly, can develop acute respiratory distress syndrome, may require ICU admissions between ten days ten to fifteen. And uh, around fifteen days, you would know if the person is turning around, is going to get better, or if they are going to get worse and potentially die. So I would say between 10 and 20 is the critical time where you'll see the change. So in general, based on uh, Chinese CDC data, 80% will have mild disease, 14% will have severe disease with hypox hypoxemia and 50% lung involvement, 6% could be critical with ERDS, shock, and multi-organ failure. So what puts you at risk to dying? So what we see in the U.S. data, up to 4,000 people that were seen between February and March. So uh, the light blue is hospitalizations. As you see, it's very similar. In fact, it is higher in younger age groups. But when it comes to ICU admissions, again, similarly, it's lower rate. But again, it's fairly high even in younger age groups, you know, 40, 50s, even in their 20s. But when you come to the mortality, that's the deep blue, you see... Most of the deaths happen in the older age groups in, by, by proportion. So age is an important factor in terms of dying. But in terms of being hospitalized, you know, it, it makes people, young people sick as well and even requiring ICU. Other factors that were noted in those who died are those who had no health conditions, less than 1% uh, were among those who died. Whereas those who had cardiovascular disease, 10% were among those who died. This is from Chinese data. Those with diabetes, those with chronic respiratory disease like you know, chronic asthma, COPD, they were likely to die. Of course, this doesn't take into account the fact that, of course, those with diabetes, cardiovascular disease could be all older. So this there could be a factor of age as well. Now, how does this COVID affect the cardiovascular system? One, uh, the, the virus can directly infect the vascular, the vessel walls, can cause inflammation, can lead to plaque rupture, can cause myocardial infarction. There is also sympathetic stimulation, the ARDS, huge strain on the, uh, on the hemostasis in, in, in general, and so there will be myocardial strain and demand ischemia too. There is a potential for heart failure, and with sympathetic surge, high inflammation, myocarditis, 
there is a risk of arrhythmias as well. So some people die suddenly, we have seen in, in, in COVID, that's not quite explained by respiratory failure. So those could be mainly from arrhythmia, possibly. Now, when people show sign of cardiac injury or cardiac strain, like elevated troponin levels, that could be a bad prognostic factor. This is a study from China, 187 people. There is another one, also larger study. But what you see here is um, time zero is onset of symptoms on the graph. Day 10 is where you start seeing the mortality rising. So on the y-axis is mortality. As you see, people mostly die between day 10 and 20. And those who die most, the one that the upper curve, uh, the gray curve, that's those with cardiovascular disease and those that show sign of cardiac injury. And then second to them, those who show sign of cardiac injury also tend to die. Those who have normal troponins and or no cardiovascular disease are the least likely to die. So those are things to watch for really in these patients. Another thing we see is brain natriuretic peptide, sign of uh, myocardial stretch and strain, that also gets elevated in proportion. Another factor they show was inflammatory markers like CRP will be higher. And I presume although they didn't report, ESR will be higher between these people. Now, this, are, this is one patient, for instance, who presented with uh, just GI symptoms. And they found that he has these impressive ST elevations in the chest leads. They were taken to the cat lab. There was no obstruction. Their heart function was reduced, EF of 20%. They required balloon pump support. And so it turned out to be they were having COVID actually. So there is now a question, you know, taking people to the cat lab has a risk of infection. So when people have signs of pneumonia, when people have signs of COVID, maybe unless they are very unstable, maybe sitting tight might be better is now people are uh, thinking right now. Another issue that happens with uh, people with uh, COVID is thrombosis. Um, so people have found that potentially they could have DVTs and PEs, pulmonary embolisms. And so antithrombotic treatment with heparin uh, could, be, uh, could be important to reduce their mortality. Um, now, another question that has been raised is how the renin angiotensin system inhibitors like ACE inhibitors like sinopril or um, angiotensin receptor blockers like losartan, how they interact with COVID. As you see in this figure, uh, ACE inhibitors and ARBs uh, do block the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, and then they block angiotensin receptor. Angiotensin 2 is a deleterious uh, molecule which affect, which can cause acute lung injury, myocardial injury, vasoconstriction, vascular permeability. So this ARB and ACE actually block this pathway. There is another interaction. This S2, inhibit, uh, S2 receptor, which is, acts as a receptor for the virus, it also acts on an enzyme and cleaves down angiotensin 2 and angiotensin 1 and makes them inactive. So S2 actually by breaking angiotensin 2 can be protective to the lung and can prevent myocardial injury. But the problem, as you see, is S2, while by breaking angiotensin 2 can have, and producing angiotensin 1 and 1.7, uh, it can help uh, uh, in vascular protection and pulmonary protection. It also acts as a receptor for the virus. So the concern is when you have S2 levels higher, as it happens in people who take ACE inhibitors and ARBs like losartan, lisinopril, the question is, will these people be at higher risk of SARS infection, SARS-CoV-2 infection? Uh, there is no clear data to support that, but there is some data to support that ACE2 could be actually protective to the 
uh, the lungs by cleaving uh, angiotens in two uh, in, uh, molecules, uh, making them inactive. Because of that, you know, although people previously had tend to suggest to stop lysinopril, losartan, and these people, the current guideline recommendation is that potentially this could be actually deleterious to people, stopping ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So people, whether they have COVID or at risk of COVID, they should be continued. The recommendation, current recommendation is to continue them on their ACE inhibitors and ARBs. That's to continue the lysinopril and losartan because of the potential benefit it may have. In fact, there are clinical trials going on to see if losartan might be protective uh, of poor outcome in COVID. Now, prevention, I think that should be the focus for healthcare personnel, protecting themselves and protecting transmission. That includes as much as possible N95 masks, especially when doing aerosol generating procedures like intubations, endoscopies, gloves, gown, face shields. If N95 is not available and if you're not doing aerosol generating procedure, like, as I said, intubation, it's okay to use face masks. Washing hands, alcohol-based sanitizers, bleach, and as I said, care with aerosol generating procedures. In intubation, that's one of the times where there is a risk of sputtering. This is, uh, on the left, you see the, um, the rendering simulation showing that if a patient coughs, how it could go everywhere. This is a simulated dye showing how all over the face it can go. And so sometimes covering with uh, a transparent plastic bag during intubation uh, procedure could, could, could be helpful. So there are no drugs or other therapeutics approved by the US FDA to treat or prevent COVID, but there are over 500 ongoing trials. One of them I wanna mention is the anti-coronavirus therapies to prevent progression of coronavirus disease in 2019. 2019. This uses combination of chloroquine and azithromycin, chloroquine being given 500 milligram PID for seven days. You can reduce the dose to daily, in days three to seven, if the patient is less than 50 kilograms. Azithromycin, 500 milligram on day one, and then 250 milligram times four days. This is experimental, but there is some sign it might work, but not really, not really established. So, but, but you know, because in the absence of any therapy, this is what most hospitals are using. These are other investigational drugs. Remidesivir, it's an RNA-dependent polymerase inhibitor. Um, it's in phase one. Toclizumab, uh, it blocks IL-6, it reduces inflammation. Most of these drugs are given as clinical trial or for emergency use, so no approved really drugs. In summary, COVID-19 is a pandemic with worldwide effect, direct indirect, due to its high transmission and significant mortality. ARDS is the primary mechanism. Age and comorbidity, CVD, diabetes, hypertension, COPD are important risk factors for mortality. COVID-19 has direct and indirect effects of the CV system leading to cardiac injury. Hello? Abit? Huh. Ah, I'm not sure how to do it. Yes, I... Okay, maybe logo for the login lark the malicious team. Okay. Okay.
All right. Sorry again the uh, the difficulty with the technology. Uh, I will be talking about COVID nineteen and cardiovascular disease. Uh, I will start with the background. I will then talk about pathophysiology, and then about how COVID nineteen interacts with the cardiovascular system, and briefly mention prevention and treatment. So COVID nineteen is a coronavirus family. Coronavirus get their name because of the spike they have, as you see on the screen, uh, on the surface, which is S protein. Based on the population composition, the type of testing, the classification they have, and the health care they have. On average, we are seeing between 4 to 5 percent worldwide mortality. Each person with coronavirus disease is, a, is expected to transmit it to two to four people, and that makes the growth geometric, as you see on the right side on the figure. And geometric growth can be very significant. And um, cases of 100 can go to thousands and hundreds of thousands quickly. And that's why the concern and the actions being taken at early stage now after seeing how the disease transmits. The other issue is 4% fatality is very high. It's at least 20, 30 times more than influenza as much as we know. At least several fold, tenfold higher. And that translates into...
but there could be sputum production, myalgia, headaches, sometimes sore throat in, in approximately 10%, and rarely 5-10% could have diarrhea. In terms of uh, testing, on imaging, uh, up to 60% will have chest X-ray findings. On CAT scan, you'll see ground glass opacities. Troponin levels will be elevated. It's a, a bad prognostic marker. Liver enzymes can be elevated. Lymphopenia, I think, is important because it's an easily available test. And if the lymphocyte count goes down, it's been shown that that could be a poor prognostic outcome. So that's something we can watch for. Potentially, LDH could have similar prognostic value too, but not as much as lymphocy lymphocytopenia, as much as we know now. Here is an X-ray of uh, a person from Italy, 75-year-old, presenting with shortness of breath and this bilateral reticular ground glass opacities. And you see it on the CAT scan too. Uh, and then on the right, we see someone from China, 61-year-old, where they have this bilateral um, airspace disease and fluffy opacities. They get coalesced and increase in a couple of days with effusions as well. So very rapidly progressing disease. So the disease course, based on Chinese data, 80% have mild disease. 14% could have severe disease, including hypoxemia and you know greater than 50% lung involvement. 6% could be critical with ARDS, shock, and organ dysfunction. So if you get an infection about five days before symptoms, it could be up to seven, eight days before symptoms, up to 14 days. Once the symptom starts, usually people around day seven, as they get worse, may require uh, admission to hospital. Shortness of breath happens also in that day range, five to 10 days. The critical time is day seven or eight up to day 15. This time is where people get worse, may require ICU admission, especially towards 10, 12, 13. And that's also the time after day 15, we tend to see whether the person really improves or gonna get worse and die. So 10 to days, 10, um, days 10 to 20. Critical. Um, in terms of critical so far, age is the most important factor. This is US data from February to March. As you see, the light blue is hospitalizations and it's comparable across the groups. Even ICU admissions is not low in the younger age groups, but mortality is quite low in the younger age groups. Once your age goes over 55, 60, it becomes very high. So uh, that's the take home really. Uh, the younger age groups also get really sick. They can go to hospital, they can be admitted, they can be need ICU, but they tend not to die. Other factors, Contributing to mortality are having cardiovascular disease, diabetes, or respiratory disease like asthma, chronic asthma. So those people, of the people who died, most of them had this. Whereas people who didn't have any health conditions didn't, were not likely to die. Of course, this is confounded by the fact that you know the people who are older are also likely to have these diseases. So in terms of the TV system, COVID causes serious sympathetic surge. It causes inflammation, it causes ARDS and uh, right heart strain. So it can cause a mind, it can lead to heart failure, it can lead to arrhythmia by this mechanism. So inflammation, it has rise, myocarditis. And what we see is that, again, based on Chinese data, uh, people tend to have sign of myocardial injury, like coprin elevation and so on, around day 10. Around the same time, also, we tend to see increased mortality between day 10 and day 10. Those people who die at the top grade curve is those people who have cardiovascular disease and who have also elevated proponents. Those who have elevated proponents, even without cardiovascular disease, as you see on the yellow curve and the orange curve, still have significant increase in mortality. Those without cardiovascular disease and without proponent elevation are the least likely to die. And, um, this correlates also with genitals related to high levels. In this point, the person presenting with the eye symptoms found for the elevations on TV and taken to cut lab, there was no obstruction. His cardiac uh, function was very good, required balloon pump, and we found to have COVID. So, this is one presentation. Now, 
the other one, what for for both is to be benefit from Buddhism, to be Sumerian Buddhism, and to anti-cognition to be something to consider. In fact, Hidaimar innovation has been shown to correlate strongly with survival. Uh, you know, when people in this product are not feasible, I think this is personal opinion, giving us to investigate the kind of goes to the cells into uh, through the S2 receptors uh, but it also the S2 receptors also interact with uh, the angiotensin converting enzyme system and uh, they do that uh, by breaking down angiotensin 2 molecule which has uh, effect on la causing lung injury and vasoconstriction so S2 can be protect potentially protective to the lung by breaking down angiotensin 2 uh, and also protective to the heart. But the problem is S2 also mediates entry of the cell into the, the, the virus into the cells. And so there is this dilemma whether we should stop S inhibitors and uh, angiosensin receptor blockers like lysinopril losartan uh, in fear of COVID. Current guideline is we shouldn't because in fact S2 could potentially protect the lung by breaking down angiotensin 2. And, uh, and uh, S inhibitors and ARBs could potentially increase S2 level. In fact, there are present day clinical trials trying to increase S2 levels in individuals to see if, uh, if they will improve COVID outcomes. So the recommendation is do not stop S inhibitors or ARBs like lysinopril and losartan in relation to COVID, unless, of course, clinical indicated like hypotension and so on. Um, Prevention measures, I think these have been discussed widely. Uh, very important for personnel taking care as well as preventing person to person transmission. If possible, use N95 mask, especially when doing aerosol generating procedures such as intubations and endoscopies. On so those cases, recommend aer uh, N95 mask. Otherwise, uh, face mask could be used, the regular face mask. This is an example where intubation and coughing could lead to spread of the virus. This is a simulation of a dye on the face of the person as trying to intubate the person, the, the patient. And so the recommendation could be covering them with a, a plastic bag. Um, treatment, the current position is that there are no drugs or other therapeutics approved by the US Food and Drug Administration on the trip to prevent or treat COVID. But there are over 500 ongoing trials phase zero to phase four. Um, and uh, I will mention just one, that is the anti-coronavirus therapies to prevent prognosis of coronavirus disease 2019. This trial is using chloroquine and azithromycin. Chloroquine 500 milligram BID seven days. And uh, you can do 500 milligram daily in days three to seven if the patient is less than 50 kilos, combined with azithromycin 500 milligram day one and then 250 milligram daily for four days. And so we'll see the result. But you know, there are some conflicting data, but there is hope that this could work. And there is also some animal and you know, small scale data that it could work. Other investigational drugs include Remedesivir, which is uh, only investigational, but it can be used uh, in charity uh, you know, on, uh, on, uh, uh, as emergency use drug as well, on charity basis. Chloroquine, uh, Toclizumab, um, is not, I don't think is really available. So I think the main focus would be chloroquine and azithromycin. And these are used as emergency drug use, really not really approved. So in summary, COVID-19 is a pandemic with worldwide effect, direct and indirect due to high transmission and significant mortality. Aridens is a primary mechanism. Age and comorbidities, mainly CBD, asthma, diabetes are important risk factors for mortality. COVID-19 has direct and indirect effects on, on the CV system, leading to cardiac injury. And this has also has uh, prognostic significance. There are ongoing trials. And uh, I, I wanna mention practical measures. One is focus on limiting transmission to care with aerosolizing procedures, things like high flow uh, oxygen over six liters or bag mask ventilation or intubation. You can try chloroquine plus azithromycin 
on you know on uh, trial basis um, consider anticoagulation or using full dose aspirin in these patients to prevent dvts and uh, watch for low lymphocyte counts and potentially high asr levels that could be a sign of poor prognosis check ekgs especially if you are giving chloroquine azithromycin to monitor QT interval and also for the QT complications. Now, if the patient is getting worse, and you know, even if you do, you're not going to intubate, intubate the patient or put them on mechanical ventilation, you could ask the patient to lie on their face down while having oxygen, and potentially that might improve their oxygenation. Something to consider. If there is the chance to intubate a patient, consider early intubation. So that's another one. And then, RAS inhibitors like lisinopril and losartan should not be discontinued other than uh, for reasons, for clinical indications, like hypotension, shock, and so on, uh, they should not be discontinued. And so that's uh, my, my talk. Uh, thank you. That was just a great can move to uh, Dr. Saifa and then we'll entertain answer. And answer the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Hello, can you see my screen? Hello? Can you see my screen? Okay. How about now? Can you see it? PowerPoint team? Okay. Okay. No, it's on. It's on. Okay.
Hello. Okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. Can you see my screen? Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yep, I can. Perfect. We can see your screen now. Okay. 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 Thank, Thank you, you uh, 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 I'll be, I'll be uh, talking about a combination of logistics as well as some critical care concepts about COVID-19. Yes. Got it. Okay. 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 Okay, okay. So, so, so I'll be doing, doing the combination, combination of, of um, um, logistics and critical care. care. Um, we, we are an, an opportune time in Ethiopia right now where um, we don't, we're, we're not overwhelmed, overwhelmed by clinical presentations of the disease. So this is the time to prepare. And what we do now is going to determine how we handle the disease uh, God forbid it is if we have a higher surge of patients. So I will, this is a busy slide, I will point out 12 things you must know as you prepare to manage patients with COVID-19. I'm assuming that everybody on this call will be a frontline provider um, or involved in some sort of planning and preparing for COVID-19 patient care. So um, I, will I will make some, some highlights. highlights. Um, first, first is have a PPE plan. 
Um, as as right, right now, when we don't have a significant surge of the disease, this is the time to acquire PPE. Um, the healthcare workers, one second. Yes. Okay. There's no other tab. So all YouTube until Nothing else. Nothing else. Okay. Um pardon the interruption. So it's very important to have a PPE plan. Um, not only having a PPE plan, but also knowing how to put on and put off uh, PPE is we're finding out is critically important. Um, it's called donning and doffing. There's plenty of videos on YouTube. So um, healthcare providers should look at those donning and doffing and follow the procedures to the T. We're seeing people come out with gloves and touch other things um, or touch their face. Um, so appropriate learning of how to do donning and doffing is critically important. Um, if N95 or um, masks are in short supply, it's good to get some uh, PAPRs, so purified uh, uh, powered air purified respirators. These can be washed and reused and cleaned. Um, obviously, they're not the most comfortable to um, uh, spend all day in these. But these can be uh, quite helpful if you get these for your really high-end frontline providers um, so that you can protect them. Um, N95 are required for um, aerosolizing procedures that we'll talk about. Uh, impermeable plastic gowns, gloves, hand sanitizers, eye shields are critically important. Um, in the U.S., we're creating a lot of negative pressure rooms because we have centralized air. In China, what they did is they opened the air they open the windows and let the air come out from a high uh, pressure confined air to the outside to create a negative pressure environment. So this is, we're familiar with taking care of TB patients. So this is airborne precautions, very similar to TB patients. So think of how you take care of TB, TB patients and use appropriate similar uh, precautions. Second point, create a hypoxemia pathway. So, COVID-19 is primarily an upper respiratory or lower respiratory tract infection. The people that will be in the hospitals will be in the hospital for pneumonia. So it is very important to determine who has mild disease, who has moderate disease, and who has severe disease. Um, uh, Dr. Sabat already told us that 20% of the people will be home with either asymptomatic or with fever and um, chills and flu-like illness, a certain percentage percentage will be in the hospital with some level of pneumonia and hypoxemia, and then three to five percent will be in a critical care unit. The way to manage these patients is to recognize them at pre presentation, who you can send home, who has mild disease, who you need to admit to the ward, who has moderate disease, and who needs to be admitted to the intensive care unit immediately, who has severe disease. So these criteria need to be established early on. That is usually based on a saturation and a respiratory rate. So by having those guidelines set early, you, you can have an algorithm and, and follow that algorithm. And as you treat those patients, monitor your algorithm to make sure that it's identifying your sick patients appropriately. It's important to use your limited resources to the people who need it the most so have a criteria for O2 saturation and respiratory rate, who is admitted, who goes to the ICU, who goes to the wards. Um, the next point that we must know is that different levels of oxygen support should be available for different levels of disease. So oxygen saturation monitoring is key in the management of patients presenting with acute symptomatic uh, COVID-19 infection. So a, a, a small pulse ox or whatever kind of pulse ox that we have 
is going to be the critical issue, the critical tool for triaging of patients. That plus the respiratory rate, of course, in addition to your clinical signs of patients who are in respiratory distress, using accessory muscles, speaking in short sentences, gasping for air, um, all of those clinical signs. But this, the algorithm has to be based on who has mild disease, moderate disease, and severe disease. Um, the nasal cannula can provide up from one to six liters of oxygen. Each liter of oxygen is, is provides about three percent on average of oxygen. So a six liter nasal cannula can go, can provide forty percent FiO two. So for your patients with mild disease, you want to put them on a nasal cannula, maintain their saturation above ninety two percent, and titrate their oxygen for from two to four percent. For the patients who do not tolerate your nasal cannula, you want to put them on a non-rebreather mask. So the non-rebreather mask that you see here is what you want. This has a closed system. This bag has to be filled and it, it um, provides 10 to 15 liters uh, flow of oxygen. Um, the non-rebreather can provide FiO2 between 60 and 90%. We, we, we consider the 60% FiO2. Um, and so it's an escalation from your nasal cannula. So for the patients that you cannot maintain a saturation and, a, and a, an acceptable respiratory rate, you need to put them on a non-rebreather mask. Again, the, the goal is to rescue patients early because before they have prolonged hypoxemia, prolonged work of breathing, and then before they deteriorate. Masks such as the oxy mask that you see here should not be used as much as possible because as you see, they have these openings and if they, when the patient coughs, they, there can be a significant amount of aerosolization. The high flow nasal cannula like that Sivad mentioned here can provide up to 100% of oxygen um, with, a nasal, with a nasal mask. Uh, we may not be using these, but these are definitely cheaper than um, using a ventilator. The high flow nasal cannula has several benefits in addition to the patient being able to breathe. There are some concerns about aerosolization with um, non-rebreather mask, but a lot of guidelines are recommending that if you put a face mask on the patient or put a non-rebreather mask on the patient, it actually reduces the amount of aerosolization. And a lot of hospitals are using high flow nasal cannula to avoid intubation. CPAPs and non-invasive ventilation are not recommended because of the high aerosolization rate and because they are an open loop system. Um, in Europe, they're using these helmets to create a closed loop system. Um, we don't have them here in the US, uh, but with um, um, we are not using CPAPs and non-invasive ventilation uh, because of the open air, high aerosolization um, risk. The next thing I point I want to make is avoid prolonged hypoxemia and work of breathing. So what we're seeing is patients who present who have an increased work of breathing, have a high inflammatory state and a high work of breathing that leads to a cascade of worse inflammation. And then at the time of intubation, a lot of patients are having um, acute decompensation and, and even coding upon induction. So we want to capture patients early we want to titrate nasal cannula to non rebreather. Ideally, if we can get it to high flow quickly so that patients are not desaturating on nasal cannula with low sats for a long period of time uh, with increased work of breathing. The one strange thing about um, COVID-19 pneumonia is patients can have significant hypoxemia with low O2 sats and high respiratory rate but they will tolerate it. They will sit there and speak to you. So the work assessment of the work of breathing is critically important. So the patients who have increased work of breathing should be quickly escalated to um, higher levels of care as opposed to patients with mild work of breathing or, or, or who are not in sequent work of breathing can be treated with oxygen titration. Um, Dr. Sabat mentioned that there's a trial out of China where they took patients with a, with um, desaturation and had them lay on their chest, uh, what's called now the awake proning protocol, and and turn from side to side. And a lot of places, including ourselves, are seeing some success in that patients do feel better. 
Um, so this is for the patient who is not encephalopathic with GCS15. We ask them to lay on their, on, their, on their chest as tolerated and move from side to side. And that's helping with VQ, improving VQ mismatch and improving uh, oxygen uh, saturation. The point here I want to emphasize is the inability to rescue patients early leads to more patients in respiratory distress requiring intubation, requiring mechanical ventilation, which can overwhelm your resources. And then, it, then what we are seeing in some places, unfortunately, where there's more patients than there's ventilators happens. So as much as possible, we want to have a protocol and a pathway where we rescue patients early that can be rescued and don't have to proceed to um, intubation by giving them different kinds of oxygen support. Um, what not to do? Uh, we want to avoid and minimize aerosolizing procedures. Um, the one mantra here is that the, your healthcare workers are your front, front line providers, and you want to make sure that they are adequately resourced as well as they are adequately protected so they can take care of the next patient and the next patient. So we are not doing any nebulization therapy. So we're using uh, uh, inhalers instead of nebul nebulizers. Uh, bronchoscopies are not being done, and a lot of these patients do not have a mucus plug that requires um, an emergent uh, 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 bronchoscopy. During intubation, mag we are minimizing bag mask ventilation, um, and we are actually um, using short-term non-invasive ventilation mode on the ventilator um, with a closed loop to pre-oxygenate patients who are in distress. Uh, to avoid uh, uh, back max ventilation. There is a HIPAA viral filter that we actually place between the, the bag mask and uh, the PEEP valve so that we can uh, create a, a, a closed loop system. Suctioning should be minimized as much as possible. Intubation is tricky, Dr. Sabat also tells um, do, do invasion want to minimize as much aerosolization and exposure as possible. So video laryngoscopy, if available, is preferred over direct laryngoscopy because it, it creates some level of distance between the patient and the intubator. Um, the different kinds of uh, covers between the patient and the intubator that are transparent are being used. Those are, those are uh, uh, good. The person who is the most senior should intubate because we want to minimize um, the amount of time that it takes to intubate a patient when, and to minimize the aerosolization. Um, so this is not the one where you want, you know, we want the youngest person to go out and try intubation. It is likely we will not have enough resources for all the patients that will require their resources. And that can be anywhere from ICU beds, ventilators, it could be dialysis machines. Um, we're seeing, we have very limited um, ECMO capability. So, Beside early, not in the middle of crisis, who um, are most likely to benefit from these high-level resources. And there's a beautiful article um, in the New England, of uh, New England Journal of Medicine from March 23rd that I think people who are working with this should read, Fair Allocation of Scarce Medical Resources in the Time of COVID-19. Hopefully, we never have to get this, but this is not something you want to do in the middle of crisis where emotions are high and people are stressed out. This is something that we want to assess and make a decision and have guidelines before we are in the middle of the before uh, we get in the middle of the crisis. Um, um, Dr. Bede asked me to focus on um, critical care management of the COVID nineteen patients. We have learned a lot in the last two to three weeks about COVID-19 ARDS. This is not the ARDS we know. 
So as we know, the management of ARDS is 6 cc per, uh, per kilogram tidal volume, um, um, uh, uh, quick proning, paralytics, maybe steroids, and uh, lung protective strategy. What we're finding is a lot of these patients actually have very compliant lungs. So um, you know, Dr. Gattanoni, who out of Italy published a lot about ARDS, is now leading um, the, the thought process that COVID-19 does not lead to a typical ARDS. Yeah, so this is, this is um, uh, on the right is a paper he published in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine that I think people should watch. There's also a beautiful video in, in, uh, uh, from the European Society of Intensive Care, Care Medicine uh, live conferences that looks, that explains an L-type and H phenotype of ARDS, uh, which means that there, there are patients who do not require high PEEP, uh, who will require low PEEP, and if you give them high PEEP, you actually over distend their lungs and make them worse. So this is a little um, uh, advanced vent management where you have to look at the compliance of the lungs and titrate your PEEP not to over distend uh, uh, um, the lungs. The other point that is different about, so sorry, so the other thing that, that this means is if the lungs are not compliant, we do not need in the non-compliant and the H phenotype patients to use 6 cc per kilogram. We could use higher cc's per kilogram because as you know, when you use 6 cc's per kilogram, patients don't tolerate it, end up requiring a lot of sedation and that's leading to a lot of patients requiring long-term ventilation, hemodynamic instability. So. If the, if the lungs are compliant and your plateaus are, are not high, you can use ATCs per kilogram or, or titrate to the patient's comfort. Um, paralytics have been used uh, in ARDS for, uh, to uh, minimize vent dyssynchrony. Uh, we are, by relaxing the tidal volumes to ATCs per kilogram or to patient's comfort, we are having to use very little uh, paralytics and that's something to be considered. Uh, steroids, we don't know if they need it for another indication. You may try it. Um, uh, there's some data that giving steroids can increase the period of viral shedding. Um, so the jury's out. Proning is key. So we talked about the non intubated patient having them lay on their chest. That improves saturation, and we're seeing that in the patients who are intubated and who have a PaO2 to FiO2 ratio. I know we don't have, we don't do ABs in Ethiopia currently, but, but an SaO2 to FiO2 correlates. So a saturation to FiO2 ratio is less than 150, less than 200. It's important to prone those patients early. Um, prone obviously is, it does not require Uh, um, technology, but does require coordination of efforts and do it systematically in a safe way. Now, we prone patients. There's a YouTube video that I put the link here that you should watch and train your nurses in, in the intensive care units on how to prone. And this just requires a coordination and uh, putting patients supine. And, you know, the studies initially were 16 hours prone, eight hours supine. But what we're finding is that patients do require to be prone for COVID-19 for 24 to 48 hours. And as their PF ratio or a, you know, saturation to FI2 ratio improves, then you can supine them. And this is the most helpful in terms of improving your, your oxygenation. Whether it has survival benefits, we will see um, is, is to be seen in the future. Fluid administration is uh, tricky. Um, obviously, for sepsis, the recommendation is 30 cc per kilogram of fluid bolus administration. Um, in these patients, that should not be done. Um, uh, the, the lungs causing pulmonary edema in the setting of severe hypoxemia can only harm the patient. So we're doing you know, 500 cc boluses at a time monitoring response and monitor the
need. Um, we want too wet for pulmonary edema, but we also we don't want too dry. So we want to ensure that patients having a urine output, you know, 0.5 cc per kilogram adequate urine output. And um, so there is a 50% incidence of acute kidney injury and requiring um, continuous renal replacement therapy. Um, so in, 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 air, in environments where dialysis is limited, we want to be very judicious about fluid administration and no um, large boluses without assessment of hemodynamic status. Um, Dr. Seba talked about the cardiac complications. I will not uh, add more, but um, just, just that, you know, I've seen arrhythmias, I've seen cardiogenic shock, I've seen severe vasodilation, and really uh, that is something that we have not, it, it happens all of a sudden and we lose patients without, uh, um, with all attempts not being successful in rescuing these patients. Um, and finally, I will say, you know, prepare, prepare, prepare. Uh, we are in a window now where we have to surge our capacity. We have to plan on um, how we use our resources and how we gather our resources. Do not hesitate to over prepare. Um, you want to be over prepared than under prepared. Train your nurses on measurement of auto saturation and counting respiratory rate. Um, identify your patients that you can you can send home quickly by using non-complicated, you know, respiratory rate and auto sat triage process. Who you need to send home? Who you need to admit the wards? Who you need to the ICU? I said, um, T proning in the ICU, I, I, I talked about quite a bit in the videos up there. Um, how to surge plan. So initially, uh, a lot of places started with intensive care providers and intensivists uh, covering ICUs. Then subsequently, a lot of places have intensivists providing five or six physicians from different specialties. Uh, who are uh, um, supporting that incident. Yeah. So uh, health work, healthcare workers may all be forced to treat pneumonia and ARDS uh, 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 respiratory failure secondary to COVID-19. So focus on teaching and preparing everyone early. Um, um, uh, in, some, in, in, in China, as you know, they built a hospital specifically for COVID-19. You know, healthcare for other diseases has to continue. So cohorting can work to make sure that hospitals don't become places where patients come in and um, get for other reasons and get COVID-19 infection. So cohort, you know, some hospitals could be dedicated COVID-19 hospitals or some wards can be dedicated COVID-19 hospitals. So it's, it's important to separate uh, COVID-19 patients and other patients. A lot, many things can be done as outpatient and many things can be done uh, using telemedicine, even phone like we are now, where patients call and get, get advice from, you know, calling centers as opposed to coming to the hospital if they don't need to. Um, the goal is not to be wrong. It's, it, uh, I'm sorry, the goal is not to be wrong. It's not to be right. What do I mean? The goal is, it's like crossing the street. You don't want to make, you, you want to be right all the time, 100% of the time. Uh, when you're right, nobody appreciates that you crossed the wrong. But when you're wrong that one time, it's, it's pretty bad. So um, when you're allocating your resources, over-prepare. And if you are wrong and you over-prepared, that's okay. But don't be, don't be under-prepared is what I mean. Ethiopia, I think, has many advantages. The warm weather may help us. Uh, we don't know, and we know that influenza um, and, and uh, the non-COVID coronaviruses don't survive long in heat environments. So hopefully that will protect us, but there's no science to say that at this time. Uh, we have good weather, open all your windows. Don't create uh, uh, um, sort of in, patient, in areas where patients with COVID-19 are. Uh, open all windows, create a negative pressure environment. That's, that's the benefits of our weather. 
Um, as you know, outside the cities, we live very dispersed and that would protect us. Um, as you know, mortality is very high with age. Median age in Ethiopia is 18. So that may protect us from mortality, but not for morbidity. So we may have a lot of sick people, uh, but hopefully the mortality would not be high. Um, the other thing is that you know more about COVID-19 today than we did, than I did a month ago. Um, the information is coming. Continue these kinds of collaborations and, and, and exchange of um Um, ideas um, and and there um, technology now allows for free of information. People.r following the COVID-19 literature is coming daily, weekly, it's changing. So follow it and adjust your practice. Um, for instance, testing a month ago, a test was taking five days for us to come back. Uh, and then for five days, we would leave patients in a negative pressure room under isolation. Now tests are coming back within three days. Um, tests are being developed for point of care testing. Um, so that the ability to have quick testing will really help you utilize your resources uh, appropriately. So these are some of the advantages we have and we should maximize on, maximize on them. And this is not to say um, to scare anybody. It's, it's to prepare and not to panic is the key. Uh, we will persevere. Um, and I'll take questions. Thank you. What? Thank you, yours as well. Be glad to.
as um, what I think is the most uh, important cause is COVID patients, respiratory or cardiovascular. I think primarily respiratory disease, I think respiratory failure is the majority, but we have seen it interact with the cardiovascular system a lot, and we call it cardiopulmonary system, really. They, they work together, and so the mode of this could be, you know, heart failure, cardiogenic shock, or arrhythmias, but most of it would be uh, respiratory failure, and I, I would let Dr. Uh, Seifer respond to that. I, I completely agree. Um, hypoxia is the number one cause of mortality. Um, hypoxemia and hypoxia. Um, by you know, the patients who deteriorate on, on the ventilator, you can provide 100% of O2, you can prone them, they improve, and there are still patients that do not. Not in 100% of O2 and on uh, with proning. So uh, we have some patients that have been. Uh, escalated with the extraporeal membrane oxygen ECMO or lung bypass machine uh, due to severe hypoxia. But as you know, that is also a very limited resource. Um, so I would say it's hypoxemia. The cardiovascular mortality is very strange, and we don't have a good method yet, as as Dr. Uh, Sivat mentioned. Um, there are conversations about doing screening echoes. I know in Ethiopia, uh, uh, point of care ultrasound is becoming popular, at least in the tertiary hospitals. So doing some kind of uh, screening bedside echoes, maybe Dr. Savat, you can, you can uh, 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 comment on that. Uh, what early studies are showing is by echoes, patients are, uh, um, uh, Patients have some level of RV strain, which is not unexpected, given given that you know they have severe pneumonia, hypoxia, hypoxemia, pulmonary vasoconstriction, causing RV strain. It's not clear if that's the cause of the RV, uh, the cardiovascular mortality, and if giving inotropes can support um, these patients with uh, 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 RV dysfunction. Um, I've seen atrial arrhythmias, I've seen ventricular arrhythmias. Um, so the cardiovascular uh, outcomes are very complex and we haven't been able to screen which patients are high risk and, and uh, how we can uh, uh, screen patients early and plan for it. Um, Dr. Savat, if you maybe have any extra comments about screening point of care ultrasound or something. Yeah. Um... I think I agree. Uh, you know, I agree with uh, uh, with what Dr. Seifer said about hypoxemia. I think that's the main thing to really watch for in our resource limited setting. As Dr. Seifer was talking about the logistics, really important to make sure we have these small pulse oximeters as much, uh, have them readily available as much as possible. Because if you leave some, if you leave someone hypoxemic at 60, 70 percent saturation for several minutes to hours, then they will have significant damage to the cardiopulmonary system and it may be irreversible. And so trying to test as many people who come with shortness of breath, increased respiratory rate, to pick the ones that require oxygen supplementation is important. And you know, as Dr. Safer discussed, escalated the capacity as much as possible. In terms of cardiovascular, what we have seen from previous studies is that uh, these people who have sign of myocardial damage, and you could see that by troponin elevation, I'm not sure how much readily available will that be. So those people tend to be the ones who die. And uh, it could be just a marker of the severity of the illness, but it could also be a marker of the underlying problems they have, their age, their diabetes, the high blood pressure, which is also becoming common in, in Ethiopia, in Addis. And uh, it could also be showing the sign of direct cardiac involvement. Now, things you could watch for additional to troponins, which may not be readily available, I would say is things like lymphopenia or ASR being very elevated. These are readily available in our setup too. 
And this tend to happen around day eight to 10. And so you start seeing those, those people will need attention. Another thing is, although this is not approved, you know, we are using chloroquine and uh, uh, azithromycin on mercy basis, on charity basis. And uh, when using those drugs, they prolong the QT intervals. And so people can go into arrhythmia. So to um, check the AKGs when possible will be uh, something important. If you find that the patient is becoming hypotensive and they are not looking like they are septic, like vasodilated, warm, then one approach would be to do the ultrasound. If it's not possible to do in everyone, then you could do the point of care ultrasound. All you need to do is just three views, one in the chest anteriorly and then one in the apex or barosternal view and apical views. And that could give you a, a good sense whether the heart is really moving or not. In those with, you know, with very poor heart function, for all these reasons we discussed, you could consider inotropic support. Again, uh, you know, availability could be varying, but we all have epinephrine. And epinephrine can be, Dr. Seifer can explain more if needed, can be diluted uh, to, to 100,000 easily. And, and then, uh, you know, it could be put in a bag to be given in a drip and could be a very good source of support. Of course, the increased risk of arrhythmia is there. But, you know, that can be balanced depending on how, what the patient's state is. That's something to consider. Uh, so those are my thoughts. Uh, okay. Another question that they raised, uh, the same person uh, Dr. Terbab raised is, uh, but, uh, and then I, I will let Dr. Seifer reflect, uh, you know, additional reflections, is uh, why children seem to have less, uh, uh, less disease. So I think... It's rightly pointed, yes, children seem to be less affected. And as Dr. Seifer pointed, that's one of our advantages because we are a young population. So one of the things we hope will, will play in our favor when this, you know, when if this becomes a real problem is the young population and the warm weather. But we'll have to see these are not fully tested. But things we know is the young lungs are, you know, have more protection than the older lungs. We see OPD and asthma. Young children's immune response is less likely to uh, respond in dysregulated manner, unlike older people's response, which can go out of control quickly. Um, young children also may have higher levels of S2, receptor, uh, S2 enzymes or receptors, which actually are protective to the lungs, whereas older people have less of that, which is less, so are less protected. And so all these factors might play a role in children. It doesn't mean they don't have infection. They could transmit the infection. So all the care should give to children are well. Uh, make sure infection is not transmitted. But at least from what we've seen so far, they are less likely to be seriously affected. But we have seen infants and even young children die. So I think the protection measure should be the same for both reasons. One, they could have poor outcome. Two, they could transmit the disease still. But the main thing is that they have these healthy lungs with high S2 levels and also less likely to overreact. Their immune system is less likely to overreact. And I will, I will see if Dr. Seife has more comments on this. Um, Dr. Terwab, I can't see you, but it's, it's nice to hear from you. Um, I don't have much to, to add except to, to agree that I've seen one paper that postulated that you know, in children, the dysregulated immune response is not as rampant as... Um, it is in adults, it's sort of a, um, not an immune suppression, but um, uh, a lack of immune dysregulation in children. And we actually see this as a continuum. You know, if a 30 year old is, um, has less mortality than a 40 year old, than a 50 year old, than a 60 year old. So it appears that age is a, is a, is a factor, uh, but I, I haven't seen anything in the literature that, um, goes more into detail about why that is. Yeah. There is also a question, I think, that might be for Dr. Seifer by Dr. Radiate about specific protocol for pruning of intubated patients. So that's an interesting question. Um, so the paper comes out of um, um, China um, this was a hospital that was not, uh, I, I believe it was not in Wuhan, wasn't the primary site of 
um, the, the origin of the disease, it was a secondary hospital. And what they did was, um, as patients came in, um, they did two things. One is they did, the nurses rounded twice a day and evaluated patients who are in respiratory distress. And if they found them in respiratory distress, they had them lay in, on their chest as tolerated um, on uh, uh, oxygen support. And they found that the intubation rate was less than 1%, less than 1%, which was much lower than other hospitals who had uh, similar uh, disease outbreaks uh, prior to that. Um, that's, that's, that's the information we have. So what's the protocol? The protocol is, you know, anybody who is able to turn themselves, just have them lay on their chest. They should not be sedated. They should not be, uh, uh, you know, uh, they should be able to turn themselves, you know, back and forth. And so that's what was done. And the numbers look good. The explanation is that somehow improves some VQ mismatch. We've actually taken this one step further at our hospital. Um, our EMR identifies patients with high respiratory rate and, or low O2 SOT, and, send in, and, and our rapid response nurses go and see those patients, increase the oxygen, have them you know, do a trial of the uh, uh, awake proning. Uh, you know, you can think of some contraindication, somebody with a fracture, somebody who, you know, was with, with CHF, you know, somebody who's not able to turn themselves back and forth, you wouldn't want to do that. So the uh, anecdotally, we are seeing an improvement and a lot of places are seeing an improvement in oxygenation. Obviously, we want to know if this has, a, a, you know, a mortality benefit. We don't know yet. It's early. It's being studied. Uh, but in in places like Ethiopia, this is something we should do. And I think the protocol that identifies patients early, again, I, I can't emphasize enough, as Dr. Sewat said, you know, have some pulse ox, teach nurses or make nurses and bet, you know, frontline providers count their respiratory rate. It's simple, you know, in a lot of places, you know, we assume somebody's breathing normal. You know, a lot of hospitals have jokes that everybody's breathing 20 or whatever the number is for that hospital. But this is a time where we need to count how fast a person is breathing, assess their work of breathing, and triage based on that low-tech assessment that can be done uh, by, um, you know, not even physicians. It can be done by nurses, by, by anybody, um, um, frontline providers. So having a pathway of identifying patients early that you give them the appropriate level of oxygen and try awake proning um, is probably the best strategy for a place like Ethiopia. And you've seen um, in, in New York and other places where large warehouses and conference centers are being turned into these hypoxemia management centers where patients with mild to moderate disease are connected to oxygen, maybe get some hydroxychloroquine and uh, receive uh, uh, and receive uh, uh, oxygen therapy. Um, I, I think that's something we have to look at very closely because hospitals will get overwhelmed um, and um, a strategy where the hospitals become the surge centers for critical care and centers um, with a lot of open air access where patients get oxygen therapy um, and get quickly evaluated and monitored if they go to a hospital is probably a good approach for, for us. Another question here by Dr. Uh, Rebecca. Um, do you have any recommendations? Uh, a question by Dr. Rebecca about recommendations on how to prioritize patients requiring mechanical ventilation in situations where several requirements, for several requirements, there is shortage. That's probably a scenario we're going to, if, if the disease takes off in Ethiopia, we'll face it certainly, and people are facing it here in the US too. Uh, I was just hearing about protocols hospitals are making, deciding on 
you know, who they will prioritize. Um, there are general guidelines. I think Dr. Seif already referred to the New England uh, article that's giving the guidelines. Maybe you can refresh us on that too. You know, this is, this is the most difficult thing that anybody wants to deal with. But let's be practical about it. You know, we already do, do even in the United States, um, this allocation of scarce resources for transplant patients, right? We, we somehow decide who the patients are who will benefit the most from transplant and patients are selected. So this is not an Ethiopia only problem. Um, you know, in, in the US we may have adequate ventilators, but we don't have adequate ECMOs. So we have to decide who gets, who benefits from this. Um, this is a very deep issue that has to be weighed with ethics, with palliative care, with your physicians, policy makers, um, you know, religious leaders, um, and it has to be unique to Ethiopia. And, and I think a committee has to be set up to do this. Uh, in the US, um, the policy in New York is different from the policy in Maryland, the policy in, in Washington, DC. So I, I think this has to be done at a higher level. Um, there are some core principles on how you decide to provide, you know, to provide scarce resources. Um, your healthcare workers should be protected. And that's why now that PPE has become a scarce resource that everybody's saying the, the healthcare providers should get the PPE first. That, so that's even an allocation of scarce resource decision. So one principle is the healthcare workers, the people who are going to save others should be protected. And that also applies for ventilators and other things. The second is, you know, benefit. We know um, age is a huge risk factor for COVID-19 mortality. But what is that cut off? What does that mean? Again, that has to be determined. I, I really encourage for people to read that New England Journal of Medicine um, article. It's very short, um, um, but, but it helped me even deal with some of the psychological issues of having to select one person versus another. We haven't had to do it yet, but it's very likely that it could come to that. So I think looking at the principles, thinking through it, and coming up with a policy early is critical because as resources get strained, people become emotional, um, and it's very hard to make that decision at that time. But um, making that decision early is important. I'm not going to, to prescribe what's right for Ethiopia because it's very complex and it needs a lot of um, input now from policymakers. Another question by Dr. Terbab that we skipped earlier is, what signs and symptoms in mild and moderate cases sent home should they look for so that they can come back promptly to seek hospital care? And so it's true, we'll be triaging, a lot of them will be.
other you know practical things yeah no i 100 percent agree with you um the, the the easy part is is separating the people you know the easiest part is the asymptomatic from the symptomatic so there are the people that will have COVID 19 they will be asymptomatic sh shedders um they will have no symptoms those are easy there will be the people with upper respiratory infections and flu-like illness that do not have a pneumonia. So the patient who's presenting with fever, rigors, aches, some GI symptoms that Dr. Sawak mentioned, but come in with no dyspnea on exertion can go home. So the dyspnea on exertion is, 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 is the hallmark. Um, so if somebody has Disney on exertion, what it's telling you is this person has has a pulmonary manifestation. Even though in 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 China, the CAT scans done on on patients 